everyone. So welcome to the new filming studio. Uh, for those that know me, I've been moving for the last month, which is why there were no videos. But here we are back in the saddle. And if the lighting is a little off and the voice is a little off, sorry for that. We're going to figure it out as we go. <laughs> Let's do, doing my best right now. All right. So today we're going to be talking about the three things that, at least from my experience, LLMs don't do a great job at when it comes to language, the thing that they really should be good at. And we're going to be going over how a knowledge graph helps mitigate or helps resolve some of these issues. So if this sounds interesting to you, make sure you stick around. All right, so the very first thing that I think the knowledge graph can help with is when the LLM doesn't really understand the depth of detail you need. So LLMs are pre-trained models and they also have a lot of guardrails around them because they want to make sure that they're giving the best response possible. The problem is they don't always have the right amount of detail to give the best response. They also don't always have um, the detail they need to give the most appropriate response. And you might think, well, what's the difference? When you're looking at an appropriate response, things that are more sensitive, so things that have something to do with politics or health, where there's um, health risks, or things that are highly disputed, those are things that the LLM tries to give you an answer, but it's usually at a higher level so that it's, it's more generic and uh, more acceptable because at the end of the day, they're people pleasers. They want to give us responses, even though there's tricks around that. Um, this is something that we can see in some examples. So, so looking at this example, we have a response, and I did this with all of the LLMs that are out there, the top LLMs, I should say, that are out there on the market. Um, so if you're trying this out, maybe it gets resolved by the time you're looking at it. But at the time of filming, uh, when you are asking an LLM, what are the uh, benefits of vitamin C on chemotherapy cancer patients? You get a lot of good responses. There's a few that give some, well, you know, it's not totally clear that vitamin C is great for all use cases. Um, but most of them just say the general principle, which is yes, vitamin C is great for cancer patients in chemotherapy except there's a very small amount of research out there that says on a very specific cancer drug, vitamin C has been shown to have an adverse effect. Now, even if it's a very small aspect um, in these studies, it's still something that would be useful to know so you can do more investigative research. The thing is, because it's not giving that specificity, because these are just the general models that everyone else is using it's not giving you that added detail that added detail makes it vague and while vague is maybe on one side of the coin safer because you're not giving anything inflammatory you're not giving anything inaccurate which are good things on the other side of the coin if you're too vague you're leaving things up to interpretation and you would think people would go and do their own research and find you know, what their interpretation of, of the data is. Except a lot of people don't do that. <laughs> a lot of people just look at it and say, oh, yep, okay, I can take vitamin C, there's no problem here. Um, now, of course, they all have qualifiers in here, especially when it's anything dealing with health that you should talk to your medical provider, blah, blah, blah. You know, all that good qualifying statement that you should listen to. Um, so in this case, if you had a knowledge graph and you had this detail, either in your own corpus of information, like a taxonomy or your content or your clinicians or whoever it might be, you can add that detail in and have it as a trustworthy source because it's coming from your knowledge graph. So let's look at this again with that one piece of information added in as a triple. So you can see here, the response is more detailed and that's good, right? but the LLM didn't have that detail before, or it did have that detail, but because of either guardrails or pre-training or you know a number of other factors, it wasn't going to that level of detail. So this happens a lot with, like I said, sensitive things or things that are highly disputed because the LLM doesn't wanna give you the wrong answer, and that's not a bad thing. But then you kinda of like rip out everything else that's, that's needed to make decisions. So that's 
the issue with with this and it's just a natural thing that happens with the LLM, but this is where those knowledge graphs can really help out. So the next thing is direct translations. So LLMs are really good at translating, but there are certain conceptual things in languages that can be translated, but if you don't know any better, you're not going to realize it doesn't actually make any sense conceptually in that other language. So this happened to me in real life. So the example is fair trade. So at least in uh, American English, fair trade has very specific connotations. There's even some legal, I don't know if they're legal, but there's um, at least societal expectations around what fair trade means. And fair and trade are two regular words. So if you took that word or that phrase, fair trade, and you translated it to Italian, you can translate it. The thing is, in Italian, this doesn't have the same conceptual understanding in that language. So this is where if you didn't have a knowledge graph that kind of expressed when fair trade was used in certain cultures or certain languages, you would fall short or you would be giving answers and they're not necessarily inaccurate. They just don't make a lot of sense. And so this is where having that knowledge graph to supply more detail into the model. And in all of these cases, it doesn't have to be using RAG. You can use these data pieces to train your LLM if you're doing training. You can use it to fact check or verify the responses afterwards to make sure that, that information is accounted for. There's a number of ways that you can implement this, but the first starting point is to have it in a codified, easy to understand way. And that's usually where knowledge graphs come in because not only can you find out you know, this idea of fair trade in Italian, but you can see other cultures that either have similar concepts that are fair trade, or you can see other cultures and languages where it doesn't exist. And so understanding all of that from a walking the graph perspective is also really important so that you can bake all of that into whatever logic you're putting into your LLM. Last and certainly not least, uh, because I could make this video a million years long, but I wanted to keep it to the top three. <laughs> and that is idioms and things like sarcasm or tonality. So again, we're getting into a little bit of uh, voice understanding uh, here as well. So you might think, well, those are two different things. And, and you're right. But the, the core understanding of what, what this point is about is there are a lot of subcultures. There are a lot of sub languages and dialects where when you are asking a question and you're using your everyday words, a lot of the LLMs will understand what you're talking about because they're based on general knowledge. But then there are things that it may not understand because it's too small of a data set to really pick up in that model's understanding. So as a silly but pertinent example is Klingon, if you are not familiar with that, it is a fictional language, but it is a real language that was created. So you can speak it. A lot of people actually do speak it um, from the Star Trek universe. And so if you're going to a Comic-Con or you're, um, you know, doing something where you are, you know, dressing up, playing, acting and whatever it, it might be, there are a lot of subcultures that speak Klingon and sometimes they just speak Klingon to each other. What you might not know is Klingon apparently has a ton of idioms. <laughs> so the LLMs are really not going to understand that very well. So you might think, well, Ashley, that's not that important. I mean, it's just Klingon. It's just something silly. Now, if you're trying to build a really cool niche thing with an LLM, it still might be useful for you to know that and understand that and mitigate it again with that knowledge graph that has those idioms and those conceptual models baked into it. But this also happens with subcultures in regular life where there are things that individuals talk to each other and they may not ever put it down on paper or in a digital form. And so that's something that knowledge graphs have been used for for a very long time. And that is preservation, cultural heritage, um, being able to take a language and create a mapping of things or how things are related to other things when there isn't a large amount of content 
or a large amount of people that still speak or use those mannerisms. And so that's where, again, that knowledge graph is really going to help. If you have that as part of your use case, or if that is something that you are trying to um, look at from a preservation perspective, knowledge graphs are really, really helpful for that because you can put these into, again, that codified model for retention. And then you can use that in your LLM, or you can use it for, um, if you want to preserve this and get it into more of the LLM pre-training, put it out as an open data set so that the LLMs can start to learn from it. That is your decision to do if you would like to do it. <laughs> Just make sure what you're doing before you do it. Um, but that's where if you as an individual really want to have personal recommendations or a personal connection with whatever responses you're getting. It's still a model. It's still statistical. It's not going to know anything unless you tell it. So if you don't tell or codify this information, this knowledge into a format, and again, it doesn't have to be RDF based. It can be a property graph. It's your, think about it from this perspective, your organization, even your team has a culture and maybe you don't like it all the time. Maybe you don't like that culture all the time, but understanding the nuances of how you as an organization or you as an, as a, as a department or a team functions, if you're developing LLMs to assist in whatever you're doing for your day job, having that understanding of your cultural pieces is actually going to be really, really important to, to, tighten up what the LLM can then provide. But it doesn't know any better, right? It doesn't know any of that. Or if it does know it, it's so minuscule or it's so diversified across different cultures and it can't really like understand it all melds together. That's where you can really assist with that knowledge graph data behind the scenes. All right, so I of course could also talk about how LLMs have a lot of um, misunderstandings. They have a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of factual stuff that people are still concerned about. Um, I actually made a whole video. I'll put it up above if you wanna go and check that out. That's why I'm not going over it in this video because I already made a video on it. And I walked through specifically how a knowledge graph helps with that. So if you're interested, make sure you go and check out that video. But for today, this is my kickoff to my next filming studio that you see here. Um, many more fun videos coming up this summer. Um, if you're watching it at some other time of year, lots more videos in general. Um, but with all that said, I hope you really enjoyed the video and I'll catch you next time.